Good morning. Uh, today we're in lesson 11 called The Last Words, and it's on chapters 31 through 37. And as always, we're going to begin praising God. So we're going to go in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this beautiful day. We thank you for the joy that we have, no matter the circumstances that we're facing in life. And we ask you, Lord, to take the messages of Job and the questions that you answer and apply them to our life so that we can bring you glory and worship you, Father, which you rightly deserve for all that you have given us. Amen. So, in uh, last week, in chapter 29, Job expressed the joy of his past. In the 30, he expressed the sorrow of the present situation that he's in. And here in chapter 31, we have his last words. Job believes that he's dying and he's fixing to die still. Uh, and these are the last words that Job has. So I'm going to read the first three verses out of chapter 31. I have made a covenant with my eyes. How then could I gaze at a virgin? And what is the portion of God from above, or the heritage of the Almighty from on high? Is it not calamity to the unjust and disaster to those who work in equity? So Job starts and he begins with the fact that he's made a covenant. Most covenants were made by God himself and they come from the outside. But this is a covenant from the inside that he made for himself. So a covenant is like a legal promise or an oath or a vow that you have. Uh, the eyes here uh, express what's in his heart, his desires. Uh, so for Job, his desire, what he uh, wants is integrity of doing God's will. So what he's trying to show here is that he has integrity. Uh, I want to read, uh, before we come back to this, I want to read uh, 4 through 7 also. Does he not see my ways in number all my steps. I have walked with falsehood, and my foot has hastened after deceit. Let him weigh me with accurate scales, and let God know my integrity. If my step has turned from the way, or my heart followed my eyes, or if any spot has stuck to my hands. So, one thing I want to begin with here. Uh, before I get in, into all this, is I want to go and read uh, Daniel 5, 13 through 16. And this will explain some of these verses here. And as we have, I think I need to skip one up and come back to that. Yes, we have here in verse 4, he says that he wants God to number his steps and to weigh him. Uh, and what do those mean? Well, if we go to Daniel 5, we read, uh, Then Daniel was brought in before the king. And the king said, Now I have heard that a spirit of the gods is in you, and that illumination, insight, and extraordinary wisdom has been found you. But I personally have heard about you, and that you are able to give interpretations and solve difficult problems. Daniel responds in verse 18, O king, most high, God granted sovereignty, grandeur, glory, and majesty to Nebuchadnezzar, your father. But when his heart was lifted up, and his spirit became proud, and he behaved arrogantly, he was disposed from the royal throne, and his glory was taken away from him. And his heart was made like that of a beast, and his dwelling place was with the wild donkey, and he was given grass to eat like cattle. Until he recognized that the Most High God is ruler over the realm of mankind, and that every set over it, whomever he wishes. And you, oh sorry, yet you, his son, Belshazzar, 
have not humbled your heart, even though you knew all this, but you have exalted yourself against the Lord of heaven. And there was a description written, and he says, now this is the interpretation. This is the inscription that was written. Mini, Mini, Tikel, Up, Harrison. This is the interpretation of the message. Mini, God has numbered your kingdom and put an end to it. So the numbering is limiting, uh, is to do with our time. Tikel, you have been weighed on the scales and found deficient. So it's the way that God is judging us. And then Percy's, the last of that, was your kingdom has been divided and given over to the Mede and the Persians. That same night, Belshazzar, the Chaldean king, was slain, and Doris the Mede received his kingdom. So what we're doing here is, is showing that he wants God to weigh him. And what we're having here is uh, Job is actually listing uh, all of his uh, good deeds that he has because, like I said, he thinks he's dying. I want to go back here. I'm sorry. The first thing that Job starts with is no sexual immorality. Really? There we go. Zero tolerance. And why does he start here? Well, there's a number of reasons he starts here. It's because this is a crucial battleground for us. It covers our lusts, our emotions, our desires, our fantasy. It talks of control of our heart, which is um, considered our mind, and of our bodies. Uh, there's a couple of verses that I want to read here. I want to read for our bodies. I want to read Romans 12, 1 and 2. Therefore, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may prove what is the will of God, that which is good, perfect, acceptable. I also want to read before I begin commenting on this, Ephesians 5. And I want to read 3 through 17. But immorality of any impurity or greed must not even be named among you as it is proper among saints. And there must be no filthiness, no silly talk, no coarse gesturing, which are not fitting, but rather giving of thanks. For this you know with certainty that no immorality or impure person or covenant's man who is an adulterer has an inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words. For because of these things the wrath of God has come upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore do not be partakers with them. For you were formerly darkness, but now you light. In the Lord, walk as children of the light, full of the fruit of the light, consist in all goodness and righteousness and truth, trying to learn what is pleasing to the Lord. Do not participate in the unfruitful deeds of the darkness, but instead even expose them. For it is a disgraceful even to speak of the things which are done by them in secret. But all things become visible when they are exposed to the light, for everything becomes visible in light. For this very reason it says, Awake, sleeper, arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. So this is where Job is trying to get, is trying to please God and serve God and do what's right. So he begins, as I said, with sexual immorality, because it has to do with not only our desires and our mind, but our body also. It's total commitment to God. The problem is doing a lifestyle of holiness is that man doesn't really want to be holy. Man wants to seek pleasures and riches. Few of us are out there that are really desiring holiness and spiritual wealth and godliness. And that's why there's many false religions 
uh, I'm not trying to pick on anybody, but the Mormons, they have multiple wives. The Nehemiahs, they have uh, free sex between all because they're not trying to please God, they're trying to please themselves. And man, as I said before, doesn't really want holiness. He wants to profit or gain something, wealth or pleasure, even in religion. So he distorts that. Uh, very few places really preach anymore that man's sin is disgusting to God. Uh, and we need more than that in the church today. We need to turn ourselves, like Job, to doing the good things. Uh, and I'm going to comment a little further on that, but I, I want to stay on this theme right now. I don't want to take a sidetrack. So this is Job's list here in 31. I won't read them all, but I'll go through them. In verse 7, he says he doesn't want to step away from the wrong way, from get off the path. He wants to follow the path that Christ has set before him. He talks in 9 through 12 about he is not allowing adultery or lust to come in, his, uh, come in his life. And adultery actually destroys families. It doesn't only destroy the family that's involved, it often it destroys multiple families. And our lust is something that we always have to watch and keep under control. Job further goes in 13 through 15 and says that he's not partial, that he's not unjust. Goes on down 16 and 17, says he doesn't oppress the weak, the orphans, the widows, the poor, of which the three friends have accused him of. Uh, in 18 to 23, he says he's righteous, that he does the random acts of, ki of kindness, that he's cheerable, that he helps the needy, he gives uh, food to the hungry, water to the thirsty. Well... There we go. I'm going the wrong way. Stay with me. I've, I've got a new little toy. <laughs> okay. In 24 and 25, he says he doesn't trust his riches and his wealth. Also what he was accused of. In 26 through 28, he says he doesn't do any idol worship. 29 through 32... He says he doesn't gloat over others' misfortune. He doesn't gossip. He doesn't curse the needy. Uh, a matter of fact, he says he's been a blessing. A blessing to not only uh, strangers, but a blessing to even enemies. Uh, people that, uh, that most people wouldn't help. But he's been a blessing to all of those. And then he says that he hasn't been swayed by wicked men of power, uh, and he hasn't tried to hide secret sins. So there's two comments there on the not being swayed. The Old Testament judgment system was set up to actually, a lot of times, it would cheat the poor and the needy, and it would protect the rich and the powerful. Probably sounds familiar to those of y'all in America today. Uh, then he says that he has no hidden sins. And what he's alluding to there is uh, being a hypocrite. He's saying, I'm not a hypocrite, because that's what a lot of hypocrites would do, is, is in public they show one face, but in private they have another. And uh, all of these things are good. Uh, and all of these things are his way of trying to live in the light, which exposes uh, sin. However, I'm going to read this, and this is where Job, to me, makes a mistake. Oh, that I had one to hear me. Behold, here is my signature. Let the Almighty answer me. And the indication which my adversary has written, surely I would carry it on my shoulders. I would bind it to myself like a crown. I would declare to him, the number of my steps, or the limit of my steps. Like a prince, I would approach him. Now, this is the passage where Job, to me, errs abundantly. 
First of all, we as men cannot demand God to answer us. Uh, not only can we not do that, there's many people that think that they could run the world better than God. That if they were in control, this is how they would do it, and why isn't evil destroyed, and how come God lets a mosquito be on a planet? They've got all kind of things. But we saw last week when we looked at wisdom that the wisdom it takes to control the universe, man could not even handle if, if he knew it. Only God has a nature which can do that. And trust me, you could not do a better job than God. Uh, but this is where Job has slipped. And the reason uh, I think of this is in his suffering, he's distorting uh, who God is and who he is. Uh, also, he's run a list here of all of his good deeds. And as good as they are, we never do any good works until that we do them because we are saved or by God's power and not to be saved or by our own merit. So Job has kind of forgotten who man is, that we are sinners, we are a creation, and we are fallen, and who God is, that he is holy, that he's eternal, that all wisdom is contained in him, that he covers the past, the present, the future. He's all-powerful. He's all-seeing. Uh, so this is where, as I said before, Job has made his era in saying, calling out God. When, when I first joined this church, I had to go in front of the pastor, and he... Uh, sat down with me and evaluated where I was spiritually. And then he had me watch some stuff and talk through and walk through some stuff of where the church is, what they believe, what the doctrines are, to see if I was a fit or the areas that I was lacking to bring me up. After that, I had to go in front of the elders. The elders uh, actually asked very similar questions seeking where I was. One of the questions that they asked me was basically what, what I base my salvation on, which is Christ's grace alone. A lot of people fail at this answer, and you can see that in Matthew 7, 21, 23, when they come before God. But the way they worded it to me was, if you were to stand before God today and he was to ask you, on what do you base your salvation, how would you answer him? Well, I told them, you know, I know the answer you're looking for, that Christ's grace alone is sufficient for salvation. But to tell you the truth, were I to stand before God, all I could do would fall at his feet and cry. I would not be able to speak. I would be speechless. Uh, there's that much of a difference between us and God. So for Job to think, even imagine that he would approach God as a prince, is a delusion. We cannot, never, ever, and I know that's a double negative, Go before God with pride in our hearts. Job would not, Job could not, and Job will not approach God as a prince. We will see that as we go further. But Job is failing to, at this point, to see God's holiness. He's distorted his view of God. He's forgotten that we are the clay and that he's the potter. And I'm going to read um, a little verse here out of a couple of verses out of Romans 9, 20 through 23. On the contrary, who are you, O man, who answers back to God? The thing molded will not say to the molder, why did you make me like this? Will it? Or does not the potter have the right over the clay? 
to make from the same lump one vessel to honorable use and another for common use. What if God, although willing to demonstrate his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction and did so to make known the riches of his glory upon vessels of mercy for which he prepared beforehand for glory. So what we have there is that our destiny, everyone's destiny, rests on the internal counsel of God's will. It's not good works. All of it is in Christ Jesus. And even though Job is in a time before Jesus, he understands to a limited degree of Christ, of the Messiah. He's talked about he needs a mediator. And so he has an example. And and that's... I'm having tech problems, of course. (laughs) Okay. Here's what I was saying. No matter how much we do, we can't do it in our own power. It's, It's all... It's all from God. Now, he says in there at the end that, uh, I guess I'm going to have to read that again. Oh, he says, and the indictment with which my adversary has written. So he understands he has an adversary also. And his adversary is not the three friends, like he thinks. His adversary is actually Satan, just like ours is. And... This is the question I was telling you I was asked. On what do you base your assurance of salvation or your promise? It's on Christ's grace alone. There is no other way. The works are not going to get us there. And I'm going to read the last few verses that Job speaks. He says, If my land cries out against me, and its furrows weep together, If I have eaten its fruit without money or caused its owners to lose their lives, let the briars grow instead of wheat and stink wheat instead of barley. And he ends his words. And what he's saying there is that even if my dirt testified of me abusing it, much less the people that I have around me, then I would be guilty. But all who know me, including the very dirt I work, knows that I do everything for their good and not for my good alone. And that's Job's thing. Now, there's a big question, and it's asked by Job in Job 9.2, it's asked by Eliphaz in 15.14, and it's asked by Bildad in 25.4. And the question is, how can a man be right before God? And there's only one way that we can be right before God. And it's the same in the Old Testament as it is in the New Testament. We just see it a little more clearly. It's only by grace, by Christ's grace, demonstrated by our faith, which is also a gift from God. It's never by our soul-tainted, insignificant works. Christ purchased us, He owns us, he redeems us, he justifies us, he's called us, he's chosen us, and he saves us. So what do we bring to the table? This is what we bring. After we've been converted, which we call conversion, and after we've been illuminated, we bring thanks, worship, and service of obedience. That's where the works come in. We're not without works. They're just after salvation and not before salvation. And that's where a lot of people have it wrong. They think we need works to become saved, and there are no good works until after we're saved. 
And I've got one more thing I want to read here, and I'm going to have to look it up because I know I didn't mark it. I'm going to read in uh, Romans 9 again, and we're going to back up. I'm going to read 11 through 21. For though the twins were not yet born, and he's talking about Jacob and Esau, and had not done any good or bad, so that God's purpose, according to his choice, would stand, not because of works, but because of him who calls. It is said to her, the older will serve the youngest. Just as it is written, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. What shall we say then? There is no justice with God, is there? May it never be. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. So then, it does not depend on the man who wills, or man's will, or the man who runs, or man's deeds, but on God who has mercy, on his grace. For the scripture says to the Pharaoh, For this very purpose I raised you up, to demonstrate my power in you, and that my name might be proclaimed throughout the whole earth. So then, he has mercy on whom he desires, and he hardens whom he desires. Those are the last words and the last thoughts of Job. So we're going to go now to Elihu. Uh, Elihu is a person who comes in, and I've already shown you in Genesis 22, where... Um, He's actually a descendant of Abraham's brother, Nahor. He falls in that line. Uh, I'm not for sure if that was the great-grandson or the great-great-grandson, but somewhere around there. But uh, Elihu, a lot of people think that uh, he was implanted in the book and that these were added. We have no evidence of that. Every manuscript ever found has Elihu in it. So I have to believe he's a real person, and I think that all believers have to accept that. He is a tricky person, however. Uh, he has a, a little different slant than the other three, uh, and I guess we'll get to that as we go through, but his slant is unlike the three friends, the three friends say that Job is guilty because of sin in his life. He says that in the suffering, Job became sinful. And he became sinful by claiming that God was unjust. That's not untrue. Uh, however, I personally uh, have a few uh, little problems with Elihu. And we'll see him right off. In chapter 32, um, he starts and he says, we'll start in verse 2, the anger of Elihu, the son of Barich the Buzite, of the family of Ram, burned. Against Job his anger burned because he justified himself before God. And his anger burned against the three friends because they had not found, or they had found no answer and yet had condemned Job. And then, if I go over, I believe it's 8 and 10, he says, The abundant in years may not be wise, nor the elders understand justice. So I say, listen to me. I too will tell what I think. And he loves the word behold. He must use that at least a dozen times, if not more. I also will tell my opinions, and I am full of words. However, now, Job, please hear my speech. Listen to all my words. Behold, now I open my mouth, and my tongue will speak. My words are from the upright of my heart, and my lips speak knowledge of sincerity. So he starts off claiming to be a spokesperson for God. That's a big claim. So really he's claiming to be a prophet. So if he's a prophet, we have to determine 
Is he a prophet or a false prophet? Um, he claims to have all the answers. The problem that I instantly have with him is, first of all, he's very young. Uh, he's younger than even Zophar, who we know very little about. So he's the youngest person here. That's why he's remained quiet. And he's been here the whole time. Second of all, he, to me, is very opinionated. Uh, I would say maybe even arrogant. Uh, so there are very many reformers who think that he is indeed a prophet, and very much like John the Baptist, he comes here at the end to pave the way for God to speak, which God is going to start in chapter 38. We're going to do next week. Um, to me, in chapter 32, uh, he just focuses on himself a lot. Um, he claims to have all the answers. He has a different slant, as I said, on Job uh, sinning. Uh, he says that the friends say that Job sinned and he's being punished. He says that Job started suffering, and then because of that, uh, he started claiming that God's unjust, and that's his sin. I can actually go along with that. But as we go further in, he says that God reveals himself in visions and dreams, and that God saves man from the pit or eternal death. I have no problem with God saves man. I have a little problem with the visions and dreams, although it's a different age here. Uh, it's, it's before Christ, so there were visions and dreams, but I keep going back to the dreams of the night spirit that Eliphaz has. And that somewhat worries me, although I don't see Elihu as being satanic uh, or influenced by Satan in the way that I see Eliphaz. As a matter of fact, uh, I kind of think that uh, at the end of Job's speech, that Satan kind of left, and he's really not on the scene anymore. But in verses 23 to 28, he says, if, if there is a mediator, an angel mediator, we have a mediator, but it's not an angel, it's Jesus Christ himself, to redeem and save man. And to me, that's a little worrisome because it's almost exalting of a created creature, an angel, and it's hard for me to believe that a prophet would come with this message. But we'll go we'll further, and you can decide on this. To restore righteousness, then Job should repent. And that's what he's asking Job to do. And a matter of fact, in 29.33, he says this is how God works. You sin, you repent of your sin, God will forgive you, that leads to salvation. That's kind of true. I'm not for sure he's applying it in the right spot. Uh, so to me, uh, Eliphaz has a confusing message here. Uh, in chapter 34, 35, and 36, he really goes down to condemning Job. He, in 34, he says Job is guilty. He says he's crazy. He says he walks with the wicked. He says he mocks God. And then he resorts to my old favorite phrase, you reap what you sow. And then he says that Job can't hide from God. He turns around, and in verses in and between these, he says God is righteous, God sustains all life, God's sovereign, God condemns the wicked, God uh, controls mankind through providence, God's uh, omnipotent, he sees all, he's on. Uh, omnipotent, he, know, uh, he has all power, uh, and he says some words of wisdom here, he said that if Job were to stand before God as he wishes to plead his case, that he wouldn't change God's mind even if he were to meet with God. A little confused on that because Moses um, kind of came to God a lot of times to, to change God's mind and Moses wasn't really changing God's mind. Moses was coming in humbleness to show God that he cared about the people and 
he wanted God to have mercy and was pleading for God's mercy. Uh, so Eliphaz in the end, he doesn't really, oh, I'm sorry, in chapter 35, I'm not through with him yet. Eliphaz says, God, it doesn't hurt God if Job sins, and it doesn't help God if Job doesn't sin. Okay, that God's indifferent to that. We dealt with that in chapter 22. That's exactly what Eliphaz says. And we looked at it then, and we determined that God does care. God is invested in our lives. He cares how we think. He cares how we act. That's one of the messages that comes out of the entire Bible, is to get us on the right path and the right track. So, Eliphaz says, the reason God refuses to answer Job is because Job is wicked, guilty, and proud. Is that the reason? Is that the reason God has been silent? Uh, I, I see different answers there, but we'll, we'll continue. In chapter 36, he says that Job acts unjustly, that he trusts in his wealth, and that he prefers evil to suffering. I've heard all of this from the three friends. So I'm, you know, I'm falling off the Elihu bandwagon here because he's reminding me of the three friends. But then he turns around in the last chapter and he exalts God. He says, God is incomprehensible. He's sovereign. He's perfect in wisdom. He's majestic. He's uh, awesome. Uh, so what do we make of Elihu? Well, I find that he's young, he's proud, he's worthy. He thinks like the three friends in the end, even though he has a different slant. But the other side is that he exalts God, uh, and the three friends never did that. So he also wasn't, to me, under the satanic influence they were. So is he a true prophet or a false prophet? Someone wiser than me will have to answer that. I do not have that answer. He's very confusing to me. In my opinion, however, and this is just my opinion, you don't have to share this at all. Most people don't. In chapter 38, where God speaks, the first thing God says is, this is chapter 2, and I think this, this could be applied to Job, but I think this verse God actually applies to Elihu before he turns around in verse 3 and starts with Job. Other people see it as he's talking to Job right from the beginning. I don't have any problem whichever way you want to look at it. It probably depends on where you see Elihu. But God says, who is this that darkens counsel? In other words, God's truth by words without knowledge. So God either addresses this to Job or he addresses it to Elihu. If he doesn't address this to Elihu, then God doesn't even acknowledge Elihu. We, he finishes talking, he says his last words, at least he finished on uh, focusing on God and who God is and uh, what God is, and that's a good way to finish. And then he's gone from history. We never see Elihu again. We never hear from them again. So what I'm left with here is that sometimes God doesn't give us the answers we seek. We ask questions. Sometimes he gives us the answers. Sometimes he doesn't. The good thing is, no matter how you view Elihu, he doesn't really change the theme in here at all. Uh, the only thing he does is give us a different slant of 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 Job, and makes us think, you know, that Job may be guilty uh, of, of sinning while he's going through suffering. He definitely distorted the view of God, and he does call God unjust. Uh, so, anyway, as we're looking at these last words, we can see that through all of this, up to this point in Job, that God's sovereign and Satan is a fake or a loser. They made a bet, and the bet was on Job, and Job has not cursed God. Job has not forsaken God. Job has not left God. He's suffering. 
He may see some things wrongly, but he's still a believer, and he's still in the camp. And God's sovereign, and Satan ain't. Uh, we also saw suffering, that we have a need for suffering. One of the questions was, why do good people suffer? And I changed that to why do believers suffer? And the reason believers suffer is because we can't spiritually grow without going through that process. There's just no way. So suffering is actually beneficial to us as much as we hate it and hate going. So that leads us to we don't let go and let God, but we pick up our cross and follow Christ. We have to do our part also. And what I call the big lie, and Job's on it right here, is that death is the end of the road. Okay, that, that's the finish line. That, bam, you're done. They nail that last nail on the coffin, and it's over with. And I know believers that are scared of death. A funeral, people are just like, it's the worst thing in the world. But is death the end of the road? Is that, is that the finish line? Because the way that I see it, before we were born, we had life. I had life before I realized it. I was formed, chosen, predestinated before I was even in my mother's womb. I was unaware that I was alive, probably what, for a year? <laughs> okay, before I really started having any recognition, a little while, quite a bit longer before I had any wisdom, but we won't go into that. Uh, but then after death, after we die, this is not the end. We have a judgment. We have a glorified body to be given. We have rewards coming to us. We have an eternal life. The big question that most people miss isn't death. It's where are you going to spend eternity? That's the big question. Okay, let's look at Christ. It was a bad day. Okay, Friday. It was horrible. They hung him on the cross. They nailed him. He died there. But was that the end of the story? Catholics still have them there, but most of us have tucked them away from there. He went to the grave. Three days later, he rolled away the stone. Resurrection. He defeated death. He defeated Satan. He defeated sin. Then he ascended up to heaven. He took the throne at the right side of God. He promised to return. He promised to come in a cloud. Then he's going to bring us with him. Then he's going to judge everyone. Every knee will bow before him. So was death the end of the story? It wasn't. And we act like too many times that death is the end of the story. And we're scared of it. And it is not the end of the story. Death on earth is not the end. I'm here to tell you that. That Christ is alive today on the throne. That when he died, it wasn't the end. That your last words that you speak here, I'm not going to say they're not going to be important. They may be the very words that bring you to salvation. But they will not be the last words you speak. You will be judged as I will be judged, as all people will be judged, after we're dead. So really, death is not the thing to fear at all. The thing to fear is God. And the thing really to fear is how we act in this life, in this opportunity that we're given. Do we recognize Christ as who He is, as the Savior? Or do we see Him as one in the crowd that wants to cry, crucify him, crucify him. Where do we stand? Okay, and if we have become believers, if we have been welcomed in the family, do we act like a believer? Do we strive to live holy, righteous, blameless lives? Do we seek God in his word? Or are we pleasure seekers? Are we wealth seekers? What's really important to us is the most important thing in your life your relationship with God like it is with Job? Or is it your relationship with your financial advisor 
for your 401k or whatever you have, IRA. That's what you've got to ask because those are the big questions. Because we have an opportunity here to change the road we're on. Once we're dead, the road doesn't change. Your destiny has been set. So we're left with three questions. Why do believers suffer? And we've dealt with that. We've answered that. The reason believers suffer is for our benefit. God uses suffering to teach us, to mold us, to make us more Christ-like, to make us more compassionate, so that we can help other people. That's, that's why we suffer. It's for our benefit. The second question we answered today. How can anyone be righteous before a holy God? There's only one way. Jesus Christ. His grace. Demonstrated by our faith, which is also a gift from Him. Never has anything, never, 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 ever, never, ever, ever, never, has to do with works. Our good works. Our good works come after salvation not before, and they're worthless. They're valueless until Jesus Christ is, takes them and makes them good works. All is in, in him. So that leaves us with one final question. Why does God allow evil to exist? Because as I said before, many people think that they can do a better job running the world than God can. They're wrong, but... They don't see that right now. But the first thing they say is, well, I would do away with all evil. I'd wipe it out. There would be no evil at all. Well, that's kind of where we started, uh, if you want to think back to that. And we messed that up. But here we go again. And I promise you, I'm going to bring you some answers to that in week 13. Next week, we're going to see what God has to say. We're going to, God's going to speak, and we're going to listen. And the week after that, we will go into the last final question. Why does God allow evil to exist? And uh, I can't wait. I'm excited. I hope you are too. Uh, so, closing here, um, Job, the three friends, Elihu, all of the men, all human wisdom, it's over. They've said their last words. It's finished with. God will speak, and we will listen to what God has to say. And think about this week, all you who think that you could do a better job than God can run in the universe, I want you all to think on that, and we're going to listen to what he has to say about you running the universe next week. And I'd like to close. Uh, we're going to be doing Lesson 12, Job 38 through 41. And I uh, pray God will bless your week. And I uh, thank you all for coming here. And we're going to close in a quick prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we exalt you, Lord. We lift you up because we know there is no one like you. It's your holiness, Father. It's your love, your mercy, your compassion that has allowed and sustained our lives. And, Father, we exalt you to the utmost, and we pray, Father, that you would help us in our walk of obedience to you and help us in our crusade for integrity. But let us never forget who we are, where we came from, and who you are, and all that you have done for us and given us. Amen.